Hello, my name is Christian Rosu, and I've been tasked with speaking to you about uh, the pathology of the descending thoracic and thoracoabdominal aorta. Unfortunately, I only have half an hour to tell you about this extensive topic. Um, so some of the slides I'll be going through very quickly, uh, especially the ones that you can read on your own. Um, you, hopefully you'll be sent a copy of the entire presentation in PDF format, um, and you'll have my email address at the end to ask uh, questions. Um, going to skip through this very quickly just to give you an idea of what uh, we'll be describing. Distal aortic dissection, basically we're talking about everything that Stanford type B um, comprises only about a third of uh, total aortic dissection. Uh, Stanford type B is also known as DeBakey type 3, subdivided into 3A which is only thoracic and 3B which is thoracoabdominal. Um, remember uh, classifications are always easy test questions. Um, the different aortic dissection variants, so type 1 is your classic uh, dissection with a perfused true and false lumen. Um, what's increasingly uh, uh, a matter of um, discussion is intramural hematoma and penetrating uh, atherosclerotic uh, ulcers, also known as PAUs. So in this uh, diagram, basically the difference between the three main subtypes of, uh, uh, of aortic uh, dissection. So false lumen that's perfused here, a penetrating ulcer, um, which may or may not have a hematoma associated. Um, usually um, they're not considered acute aortic syndromes unless they're symptomatic or if there's a hematoma associated. And then an intramural hematoma, which some uh, consider a subform of dissection uh, with a uh, thrombosed, uh, totally thrombosed false lumen. Um, recently uh, published uh, reporting standards for uh, aortic dissection, so another way to describe um, uh, and better characterize aortic dissection than the Stanford and DeBakey classifications. Um, obviously, if the uh, if zone zero is involved, it's considered um, a type A dissection. Um, and um, surgery is usually warranted. Um, there's also the type ID here, an unidentified entry tear involving zone zero. Uh, for practical purposes, that also just goes straight to uh, surgery through median sternotomy. Uh, the temporal classification um, has been updated in more recent years. Um, the um, classic classification of acute being less than 14 days and chronic being uh, more than 14 days based on natural history data from the 1950s on um, type A and type B dissections. So basically the, the numbers of 50% uh, mortality in the first 48 hours uh, comes from this old paper. Um, the IRAD has uh, more recently revised um, this data and uh, has divided into four phases. So hyperacute, uh, in the first 24 hours where the mortality is highest, especially with type A, um, and then two to seven being acute, two to seven days being acute, eight to 30 days being subacute, and greater than 30 days being chronic. Um, things that you need to know but should read on your own, uh, epidemiology and risk factors of uh, aortic dissection, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, and diagnostic modalities. Um, for practical purposes, the, di the primary diagnostic modality is going to be uh, CT angiogram for most, uh, for most cases. Um, medical treatment is necessary, um, up on, um, including in type A uh, dissection up until the time of surgery. And it, the principle is of anti-impulse therapy, which is the lowering of uh, the change in pressure over the change in time. So basically this, uh, the slope of the blood pressure curve. Um, you see here B is baseline. If you use a pure vasodilator, um, you will decrease the blood pressure, but you will actually increase the slope. So that is contraindicated. You want to use something that will decrease inotropy, which is typically going to be beta blockade. Um, so the goals are basically aim for a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, systolic blood pressure of under 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, you can actually go even lower and um, aim for about 100 if you can maintain uh, organ perfusion as 
manifested by mentation, urine output, uh, and absence of uh, coronary ischemia. Um, what will help control blood pressure is, con uh, is controlling the pain. Um, so never forget about the pain, pain control. Um, the definition of uh, acute uncomplicated type B versus complicated uh, comes down to these following elements, recurrent pain, recurrent pain, refractory pain, if you have any type of malperfusion, so limbs, viscera, um, uh, if you have extension of dissection, refractory hypertension, um, and rupture. Um, overwhelmingly, most type Bs are uncomplicated, um, and that begs the question, okay, you've gotten the patient through the acute phase with medical treatment, now what? Um, the most common late problem is uh, aneurysmal dilatation and uh, subsequent rupture. Um, basically, it's a uh, relevant problem uh, reported at uh, reported at different rates and different studies, um, but basically a large number of these patients will come to need uh, intervention um, after uh, surviving the initial episode. Um, increase, there's increasing interest in risk factors for poor aorta-related outcomes after acute uncomplicated type B aortic dissection. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but patients uh, who have refractory uh, or recurrent pain uh, or uh, hypertension could be considered complicated, um, but these patients have a higher risk of rupture in the short term. In the long term, um, these anatomic factors um, seem to predict a uh, poor long-term outcome, and increasingly um, surgeons will intervene uh, on these patients in the subacute to chronic phase, usually within the first uh, eight to 12 weeks. Malperfusion with a type B dissection, um, all of these different uh, vascular beds are at risk. Um, there's important to know that there's basically two types of uh, malperfusion. Uh, the uh, type of malperfusion demonstrated in image A is what we call dynamic malperfusion, where the false lumen is pressurized and the flap moves over and compresses the true lumen and limits flow to a vascular bed. In image B, we see static malperfusion where the dissection process itself uh, extends into a target vessel ostium and thus compresses the true lumen directly in the vessel and um, causes um, ischemia of that uh, organ and you as you can see in the lower diagram um, demonstrated in different views you uh, can also have uh, combined static and dynamic malperfusion so once again this is um, dynamic malperfusion with the flap um, that's pressurized by flow in the false lumen and causing obstruction of the target vessel whereas this is static malperfusion where the uh, dissection process extends into the target vessel and can compress or even cause thrombosis of said vessel. Um, so additional treatments for malperfusion um, and additional in the sense of presuming that you have already performed the TVAR and there is residual malperfusion. Um, increasingly in the literature, um, the petticoat technique of extension distally with a bare metal self-expanding stent. Um, the only one available on the market currently in most of the world is the Cocosine of Dissection Stent, and this allows extension down into the thoracoabdominal aorta. Um, so that helps re-expand the true lumen. Um, for patients with static malperfusion, you may need to perform branch vessel stenting uh, with a self-expanding stent. Um, other techniques, uh, usually not, uh, usually performed in patients who are not candidates for TVAR uh, plus or minus adjuncts is intimal flap fenestration, which basically serves to equalize flow in the true and false lumen um, and to depressurize the false lumen um, and is typically performed in the infrarenal aorta. This technique can be performed endovascularly or uh, through open surgery. Um, 
in these types of cases in real life and on an exam situation, you're going to want to seek help from endovascular experts or vascular surgery. Um, so this is a demonstration of one method for um, fenestration of the false lumen. So you just create a big hole in the intimal flap after having punctured it with an angioplasty balloon, which is often 12 to 14 millimeters. Uh, this is a technique for open um, intimal flap fenestration of the visceral aorta. So when you're performing a T-VAR uh, or any other endovascular aortic repair, one of the primary uh, things you want to think about is where do you want to land? Um, T-VAR landing zones um, are described initially uh, by the Ishimaru classification. So the new uh, reporting uh, standards um, shown previously in this presentation uh, are based on this. So landing in zone zero or zone one requir it requires some type of debranching or extratomic bypass. Um, if you're going to be landing in zone two, which is anything between um, the left common carotid and the, uh, the end of the subclavian, um, you may or may not want to perform a uh, subclavian artery revascularization, um, or you can decide to um, perform it uh, as needed for symptoms um, after T-VAR. Um, this and as far as landing zones go, and this applies to type uh, B dissection and for annual disease, you ideally want two centimeters of landing zone proximal and distal to your pathology. Although this still, uh, as far as the aortic dissection goes, is less uh, uh, is less of an issue. Um, in terms of oversizing for T-VAR, when you're treating a chronic aneurysm, you want a 10 to 20 percent oversizing in patients with an acute aortic syndrome. Um, there's data that I'll mention later that you don't want to oversize more than 9 percent because there's an increased risk of retrograde type A aortic dissection, which we'll, again we'll talk about later in this presentation. Um, seal length, as I said, you ideally want 20 millimeters. Um, in the case of aortic dissection, um, the ideal is 20 millimeters of non-dissective aorta um, as a proximal landing zone. Um, practically, does that happen all the time? No. Um, and I'll show you a study um, a little bit later on what happens if you don't have um, that kind of landing zone. Um, what you really want is at least uh, 20 millimeters proximal to the primary entry tear. Um, and then the total treatment length um, in the case of aortic dissection, um, you want to extend at least 10 centimeters distal to the primary entry tear. Um, so the goal of coverage in acute type B dissection is to cover the entry tear and re-expand the false lumen in patients who have uh, malperfusion. So typically this means at least 10 to 15 centimeters. Uh, increasingly thought leaders um, in the field will be um, covering most of the descending thoracic aorta using uh, 20 centimeter long grafts. Um, if you have a patient with rupture, you at least want to cover the entry tear and the site of, uh, and the site of leak, as in the, uh, the site of rupture. Um, this site can often be unclear. Um, so you frequently need to pave the whole descending thoracic aorta. Um, as you can see in this diagram, overwhelmingly the, the, um, the majority of entry tears are close to the left subclavian artery. Um, occasionally, despite um, paving the whole descending thoracic aorta in a ruptured type B aortic dissection, there may be persistent uh, uh, extravasation um, from the rupture site, uh, which is always in the false lumen, and uh, those patients may need uh, false lumen embolization, which is beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. Um, we talked about covering the left subclavian artery, who absolutely needs preoperative revascularization. Any patient which has a patent lima uh, coronary bypass graft, patients with dominant left vertebral artery or left vertebral with a terminal pica, basically no basilar connection and no uh, collateral flow to the posterior cerebellum on that side. If you have a hypoplastic or stenotic right vertebral artery, then you're going to want to vascularize the left subclavian. Um, prior to covering uh, it, uh, patients with a left arm 
um, AV fistula or graft um, will need vas re left subclavian revascularization if you're going to keep using that fistula. Um, why don't we do it to absolutely everyone? Subclavian artery revascularization is not completely benign. There are risks of injury to the vagus, which lies next to the common carotid artery. There's risk of phrenic, uh, phrenic nerve injury. There's also risks of uh, thoracic uh, duct injury uh, with chyle leak in the surgical site. Um, these are the left subclavian artery revascularization guidelines from the Society for Vascular Surgery. So there's a um, strong recommendation for these uh, for revascularization in these patient populations. There's also a weak recommendation for routine revascularization in patients undergoing elective TVAR with coverage of the uh, the left subclavian artery. So. This is just included to show you the two different types of uh, subclavian revascularization that is possible. Um, I don't think that the technical aspects of, uh, of these procedures is within the scope of uh, cardiac surgery, but at least know that uh, you can either perform a bypass or a transposition which, uh, where you uh, transect the left subclavian artery proximal to the vertebral artery. Um, this procedure, the transposition, is contraindicated in patients who have a patent internal mammary artery. Um, other type of debranching procedures are shown here. So um, this is for patients where coverage um, in zone, uh, zone two is inadequate, um, and you have to debranch the left common carotid artery as well. Um, important to note that. You want to plug the um, uh, plug the origin of the left subclavian, or else you get retrograde flow um, from your uh, from your debranching procedure uh, into the dissection or the uh, aneurysm. Um, coming uh, through the pipeline are endovascular options for left subclavian preservation, um, including um, these grafts from Medtronic and from Gore. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what does it change that you don't have um, 20 millimeters of undissected aorta proximal to um, uh, uh, proximal to your uh, entry tear? Basically, um, this study from um, from the um, stable group, which studied uh, coverage of um, the thoracoabdominal aorta with a uh, uncovered self-expanding stent. Um, they looked at basically seal the, the length of undissected aorta um, um, in the, the proximal landing zone and any patient that had um, less than 20 millimeters um, of undissected aorta um, in the proximal landing zone um, had uh, high risks of complications and a less durable repair. Um, the implication of this um, is basically that you have patients where the dissection or hematoma extends into the arch um, and um, these patients can be described as non-A, non-B aortic dissection or intramural hematoma basically where the um, the distal arch between the left carotid and the left subclavian is involved. Um, the systematic review and meta-analysis of these patient populations shows that the 30-day mortality of patients treated with, uh, these types of patients treated with medical therapy was 14%, which is drastically higher than um, otherwise uh, uncomplicated type B dissections that do not involve the arch um, with uh, rates of uh, type A dissect, uh, significant rates of type A dissection and stroke. Um, and compared to more classic type B dissections, um, the mortality rate um, with medical therapy is higher and thus you want, may want to consider early intervention. Um, something I've added this year 
um, is the relevance of the frozen elephant trunk procedure for type B aortic dissection. Um, so basically when, pa when a patient cannot have a T-VAR that can be performed safely, so if you have an acute type B with a retrograde component, and you have hematoma or dissection in the arch, and basically you have no health, you're going to land your graft um, in a uh, unhealthy landing zone, um, or if you have patients with an aortic arch, or you're sending an aorta that's greater than four centimeters, which is at, uh, at a higher risk of retrograde type A dissection. Um, if you have a aortic morphology that's um, hostile, such as ex extremely angled, and patients with no distal access um, available, such as uh, occluded or extremely tortuous iliac arteries. Um, one could argue then that in uh, those patients that aren't candidates for TVAR, why don't you perform a surgery through the left chest, as we're going to describe later? Well, the advantage of frozen elephant trunk as compared to left chest surgery is that you treat uh, any arch and descending uh, aortic uh, pathology. You avoid, you avoid um, postural lateral thoracotomy and you uh, can uh, perform a uh, repair with less hypothermia and while protecting uh, the brain. Um, frequently, you'll also be avoiding sewing to dissected um, aorta. Um, this is to demonstrate a technique from uh, Sun's group in China, where um, a uh, frozen elephant trunk without arch replacement is performed, and the um, the uh, TVAR is deployed uh, anti-grade under circulatory rest into the arch distal to the uh, left carotid, uh, and then sewn in place. Uh, basically precluding the possibility of a type 1A endoleak. Um, this uh, technique was reserved for patients um, that had no uh, aortic pathology at the level of the anastomosis. Any patient where the arch was dissected or full of hematoma um, between the carotid or the left uh, between the carotid and the left subclavian underwent a formal total arch replacement with a frozen elephant trunk. Uh, which can be performed, for instance, with a thoraflex graft. Um, TVAR, how to do it, like anything endovascular, it's all in the planning. Um, you need a certain amount of wire skills for, uh, for the execution. Um, honestly, a TVAR implantation does not require um, very extensive endo skills, but if you get into trouble, the bailout can, be, can, uh, can require a little more advanced en uh, endovascular skills. Um, usual workup paying particular attention to renal function, contrast allergy. Um, ideally, you want imaging with thin cut, i.e. one millimeter or less, although at, uh, up to 2.5 millimeter thick slices would be acceptable. You wanna do a uh, multi-planar reconstruction and center line reconstruction. It's helpful to be familiar with software such as TerraRecon, 3Mencio, um, Osirix or um, the new free version of Osirix, which is called Horos. Um, and this allows accurate measurement of aortic diameters. You need to plan your access, plan your landing zones, and you need to plan the angles for stent graft deployment. Basically, you want an orthogonal view to the ostium of the vessel you don't want to cover uh, and eliminate the parallax. So often this means being orthogonal to the uh, left common carotid. Talking about access real quick, these are typically large board devices, although in recent years, um, they're not as big as they used to be. Um, the Cook and Medtronic graphs are inserted bareback into the body. Um, the Gore device, which is like a large covered stent that's uh, uh, not really wrapped up, needs to be inserted via a sheath. Um, keep in mind that uh, a sheath is described by the French size um, of the inner uh, of the lumen and will typically be two to four French larger on the outside. Other devices that uh, are less commonly available in Canada are the Bolton device. So I've included um, these slides to just give you an idea of how large um, these devices are and of the different sizing options. Um, here it is for Cook. Medtronic has recently um, released their new version, the Valiant Navion, which is a smaller outer caliber um, than the previous generation, the Valiant Captivia. Um, the evaluation and strategies used to manage access also pertain to TAVI, um, just that the sheaths and devices are larger than the TAVI ones. 
Um, you need to look at the whole course the device will have to travel. Um, don't, make, don't make the mistake of looking only at the femorals. Um, you need to look at the iliacs for diameter tortuosity calcification. Sometimes the aorta itself will have significant tortuosity, which could make um, bring your, getting your device into place difficult. Um, almost always femoral access, arguable whether you want to do a cut down or percutaneous. Um, increasingly people are using percutaneous technique, but if, uh, if that's not something you're familiar with, you're much better off doing a cut down technique in real life or an exam situation. And then you usually want a second access uh, for your pigtail to do your aortogram. In terms of access, um, access tortuosity, usually the way to manage that is using a very stiff wire, which we, we call the Lunderquist. Um, rarely you'll need a through and through wire, also called the body, a body floss, which depending on uh, your procedure, might want to be either through the right brachial, the left brachial, or rarely transapical. Um, if you have small and calcified iliacs, there are endovascular options. Uh, including balloon angioplasty, using large caliber uh, Coons dilators. Um, occasionally, you'll need to perform an endoconduit, which is also known as paving and cracking. And if your um, iliac access is prohibitive, um, particularly as far as the external iliac goes, uh, the open options include, uh, the open option is to perform a retroperitoneal exposure um, of the bifurcation of the common iliac and perform either a direct puncture or a conduit creation, um, which is probably going to require an, uh, assistance from vascular surgery. So this is a very diseased external iliac. Um, so a covered stent has been put into place and then they're post dilating and basically rupturing the vessel so you can pass your sheath through. So this is the paving and cracking technique. Um, this is the technique for uh, doing a flank incision and doing a retroperitoneal exposure of the common iliac bifurcation of, uh, to which a uh, conduit is sewn to pass your stent graft through. Often easier to pass it through a counter incision just to make the lie a little easier. As far as imaging goes, uh, we mentioned uh, preoperative imaging earlier. Uh, intraoperative imaging uh, in type B dissection specifically can be form, performed solely with fluoroscopy and angiography. IVUS is definitely useful, but not necessarily widely available in Canada. Um, in specifically the situation of type B dissection, that you have to be absolutely sure um, that your wire is in true lumen the whole length of where the stent graft will be implanted. Uh, you need to be careful because your wire can inadvertently go from the true lumen to the false lumen back into the true lumen without you realizing it. So one can either use IVUS to image the whole, uh, the whole track of the wire once you've placed your wire in the ascending aorta. The other technique, uh, which is less costly, is basically once your uh, wire is in place, you take a long sheath. Uh, oftentimes this will be, uh, require a 70 to 80 centimeter sheath. You put your sheath all the way up to the proximal descending and then you do angios at multiple levels uh, as you pull back um, to confirm that the wire is in the true lumen the whole length of the way. If you're doing IVUS, um, you can clearly see that the wire um, and, uh, is in the true lumen um, with respect to your flap. Um, these are images at uh, different levels. You can see the branch vessels. Um, as far as the actual deployment, if you need multiple components, you always have to make sure that a bigger graft goes inside a smaller graft. Otherwise, a smaller graft will float inside of a bigger graft and you'll have a leak. Um, sometimes that requires deploying the distal graft first. Sometimes you can use a tapered graft. Um, those are available um, from the different companies. The exception to deploying the distal graft first is an acute type B dissection because if there, you have a theoretical risk of rupture if you stand distally um, while leaving the entry tear, uh, the primary entry tear, which is proximal open. Um, with endovascular devices, keep in mind you can pretty much always pull back but often can't push forward. Um, so better to start the deployment a little more proximal than distal. And if you're deploying in the arch or the distal arch, um, you're gonna be pushed back um, by the cardiac output as you start to deploy. So you wanna consider some 
cardiovascular management, which could be in the form of rapid RV pacing, permissive uh, induced hypotension uh, with the help of anesthesia, use of adenosine, or translatedly uh, drop the cardiac output by using a IVC balloon occlusion. Um, the d deployment techniques differ slightly between the devices, so you have to be familiar with that. Um, and then as far as uh, balloon molding after the stent grafts are deployed, in particular in the case of uh, acute dissection, you want to try, you want to avoid ballooning in the arch 95% um, of the time. Um, you need to balloon the junctions between the, um, between the components and keep in mind that when you're ballooning, the goal is molding, not angioplasty. Um, you could theoretically rupture the aorta um, if you're uh, ballooning in a seal zone uh, too aggressively. TVAR complications, these are the types of endoleaks, which I'll let you become familiar with. Um, as far as um, consent discussion goes, uh, the risk of endoleak and graft migration is something that should be mentioned um, and the risk of reintervention and and consequently the need for long-term surveillance uh, is important. Um, this is called iliac on a stick. Fortunately, it's exceedingly rare with the uh, lower profile devices uh, that we have these days. Um, that being said, iliac rupture does happen um, in a less uh, dramatic uh, way. So what do you do? The first thing is, what do you not do? Never lose wire position, um, because as long as you have the wire, you still have options. Um, let anesthesia know what's going on. You need to obtain proximal control in some fashion. And then you usually want to call for help if this kind of badness happens. Um, and if you don't have covered stents on hand, then you're going to want to have them on hand. Um, and then before you start trying to fix it, um, once you've gotten control, um, you need to let anesthesia catch up and get the pressure back up before you uh, perform your repair because that'll usually involve um, uh, opening up that proximal occlusion. Um, other serious complications include retrograde type A dissection. Risk factors uh, include a dilated ascending aorta, excessive oversizing, as in above 9%. Um, there seems to be more, uh, comp more of this type of complication when dissection, uh, especially acute dissection, um, is the pathology being treated, and also if your proximal landing zone is in zone zero. So here are some classifications from for aneurysm extent in the descending, proximal, uh, middle zone, distal, the Asteri and Safi classification is a little different, basically proximal, distal, the whole thing. Cross, Crawford classification, main thing to retain is that above or below the sixth rib and above or below the renal arteries. Guidelines for asymptomatic aneurysms, everything's based upon this hinge point around six centimeters. <clears throat> Some of the most recent guidelines are the Canadian ones. Um, these are the most, the most recent um, and comprehensive guidelines on descending thoracic aortic diseases um, that could possibly be on your exam. Um, these are vascular surgery guidelines, um, so it's a little hard to say if you're going to be expected to know them, but uh, just know, uh, it's fair warning that uh, these exist. Um, the cardiac surgeries, so STS, uh, AATS guidelines are getting sort of old. They're from 2010. Um, and these uh, STS guidelines for TVAR are um, from 2008. These are the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Um, so they're all relatively similar um, with no dramatic differences. Um, um, so I'll leave that uh, to you to read on your own. As far as open repair goes, um, all workup is basically you want to look at cardiac status, pulmonary status, and renal status. Um, perfusion adjuncts and anesthesia monitoring uh, adjuncts. Um, one of the main things is usage of a CSF drain. Basically, any uh, patients that are lacking collaterals to the spinal cord. So um, if you've had previous coverage of uh, intercostal or lumbar arteries, or um, ligation due to 
previous uh, thoracic or abdominal aortic repair, um, be that endovascular open. Um, if you have, if you're going to occlude uh, a non-revascularized subclavian artery because the vertebral artery that comes off of it is a source of flow to the blood, to the spinal cord. Um, also, any patients with diseased internal iliac arteries are at slightly more risk. Um, so consider using a, a CSF drain in these types of patients, um, especially extensive coverage of the thoracic aorta. Um, CSF drains do have complications. Um, they're fairly infrequent, but can be, uh, can be significant, including uh, subdural hematoma, meningitis, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, which is associated with rapid drainage of large amounts of CSF. Um, as far as spinal cord injury and prevention um, is concerned, um, basically you can have lower extremity paraparesis or paraplegia due to anterior spinal cord ischemia. Rarely it will be uni unilateral um, and it's typically multifactorial as outlined below. Uh, remember that the anterior spinal artery um, is the source of blood flow to the anterior two thirds um, of the spinal cord, which is the motor area. Um, there's the notion of the art arteria radicularis magna, which is also known as the artery of Damkiewicz, which comes off in the vast majority of patients between T7 and L2. Um, um, that being said, there is a, a vast uh, collateral network um, in the spinal cord and with the uh, paraspinal muscles. Um, and <clears throat> there is... Um, collateral blood flow coming from the vertebral artery and from the internal iliac arteries. So uh, much of this literature comes from the uh, thoracoabdominal EVAR world where there is no opportunity for revascularization of intercostals or lumbars. Um, know that there's intraoperative and postoperative factors that can lead to spinal cord injury. Um, postoperatively, hypotension, hypoxia, hypovolemia, and anemia uh, can all lead to decreased O2 delivery to the spinal cord collaterals and can lead to spinal cord ischemia. Um, hence, you can have immediate, um, so basically uh, spinal cord injury upon waking or delayed spinal cord injury, which can occur uh, rarely as much as several weeks postoperatively. Uh, although typically it's the first five days that are uh, critical. Uh, prevention is multimodal. Often we target maps of 80, sometimes even 90 to 100. Um, to optimize basically the spinal cord perfusion pressure. Um, the spinal cord drain helps lower the CSF pressure, um, which approximates oftentimes the CVP. Um, thoracic aortic cross clamping causes an acute rise in CSF pressure and CVP and drop in the distal map. So basically that causes drop in the spinal cord perfusion pressure. Um, the uh, pathway to spinal cord infarction is sort of multimodal. I'll let you look at this. Um, CSF drain insertion um, in one slide. Uh, probably not very important to retain. Um, some literature showing that the use of CSF drainage, uh, this is the protocol from Lars Venson at the Cleveland Clinic who uses intrathecal propavirin as a vasodilator. So always basically a multimodal approach um, with uh, active cooling and use of distal perfusion to prevent spinal cord ischemia. Um, so uh, the, colder the, uh, the colder the patient is, the less risk of uh, spinal cord injury and also uh, distal perfusion um, beyond the clamp time of 40 minutes seems to help limit um, spinal cord injury. This is a randomized study from Caselli's group in Houston in type one and type two thoracoabdominal um, aortic aneurysm repair, um, basically demonstrating a 80% reduction in the relative risk of postoperative deficits um, with say CSF drainage. Um, and keep in mind that um, patients who develop uh, spinal cord injury have a uh, poor outcome with about 50% um, dying. Um, here's a quick overview of open surgery for uh, thoracic and thoracoabdominal aortic pathology. 
when I think about distal aortic perfusion techniques. So left heart bypass, which usually involves draining either the left atrium or the proximal descending uh, thoracic aorta in cases where the pathology is more distal. <clears throat> you can also use uh, partial flow cardiopulmonary bypass or full flow cardiopulmonary bypass with hypothermic circulatory arrest. Um, the alternative is basically the old-fashioned clamp and sew, uh, where your distal aortic pressure is dependent on blood flow via natural collaterals from above the clamp to below the distal clamp. Um, so a example of distal uh, of descending thoraco a descending thoracic aortic repair through a postural lateral thoracotomy, um, proximal clamping, um, proximal to the uh, left subclavian, end-to-end um, -end anastomosis, best to transect the aorta to get yourself away from the uh, esophagus, ligation of proximal intercostals, use of distal, uh, um, distal perfusion with the left heart bypass circuit, and here's the distal anastomosis. Um, so positioning for that type of uh, surgery is basically uh, standard uh, left uh, postural lateral thoracotomy. If you're doing a thoracoabdominal repair, then you want the uh, chest at a steeper angle with the hips flatter. Um, as far as cl uh, clamping goes, we do what we call sequential clamping. So you want your distal clamp relatively high up in the chest. Typically, it'll, it'll be around the T6 level to give yourself a little room to work. Um, left heart bypass, which is going on, proximal anastomosis. Then once that's done, you move the clamp down um, and you continue the repair. And as you uh, perform anastomosis, you move the proximal clamp down to reperfuse. And then postoperatively, obviously a number of complications possible, but once again, going back to the delayed paraplegia, um, CSF, uh, uh, basically a rescue protocol for patients that de develop delayed paraplegia um, from the Safi and Estrella group in Houston. It's the COPS protocol, so basically CSF drain, oxygen delivery, and patient status. Um, and uh, you are able to rescue some of these patients. So unfortunately, that's all the time I have. Uh, you should be getting the slides, which include uh, some more information about certain studies like uh, adsorb and instead excel which are uh, important to know for your studies um, you can uh, reach out to me uh, at the following email and uh, all the best